Okay. Hi. 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 Okay. So uh, William Hutchinson is a landscape architect at the New Mexico Department of Transportation in Santa Fe, New Mexico. William leads a talented team at managing agency off the pavement programs, such as NEPA public involvement in transportation design, public art, contextually sensitive design, and ecological revegetation and management of the agency's 200,000 plus acres of roadside right away. Today, William will be presenting on how NMDOT is tackling challenges associated with seed based restoration in the drylands of New Mexico. Are you all set, William? I'm all set. Um, okay, you can go ahead, and, go ahead share. and share your screen. Can you everyone see that? I hope. Yes, that looks good. Excellent. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here today visiting with you all. So, um, yes, the DOT has uh, 15,000 linear miles of uh, roads in the state. We have a narrow strip of land along them. Um, it's often in better condition than uh, adjacent rangeland due to grazing practices in the state. So we are treating that area as a bioreserve, if you will. Uh, we manage a small zone typically um, along the edge of the pavement. In this image, you'll see um, we typically do one pass mowing over probably 70% of our system and leave the rest of it alone. So um, our uh, approach these days is to take a close look at what the rest of that area looks like, what we can do to um, further it as a bioreserve. With climate change, we know that it is a source of plant migration moving north in the state. So we typically try to leave it alone, but we are looking at um, ways that we can increase it uh, as a pollinator habitat. Um, there's also an economic piece because New Mexico is a scenic state and we want to have our roadside look um, as good as possible. And so we, we just have a lot of programs we're working with right now to see how we can enhance this. Um, the department uh, DOT disturbs probably um, maybe 2000 acres of land a year along its right of way perhaps 1% uh, of its system every year, half of that due to construction, half of it due to maintenance activities. And so we've uh, long been looking at the best and most efficient ways to revegetate that. Um, we also have, and I'll show you some images later on, um, some very interesting projects um, having to do with um, the dust situation in the southern part of the state. Aridization or des desertification of the state is uh, creating um, increasingly serious um, situations and hazards for the traveling public. And I'll describe a little bit of what we're doing on that because we're working in these instances way outside our right of way on state trust land and um, on BLM land, um, trying to mitigate dust and um, do some ecosystem restoration. So that's kind of an overview. Um, the, uh, I don't want to bore you with too much of this kind of thing, but we do have a legal requirement under the US Clean Water Act to restore land um, that is disturbed. Um, it is to protect the waters of the US. Essentially, every project we have has to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. And um, we do, of course, revegetation. That is done through our contracting mechanism, typically with um, the prime contractor hires a revegetation contractor, we write the specs for it. And the narrow requirement is that we get uh, vegetative cover equal to 70% of adjacent undisturbed or in arid lands, the construction general permit gives us a pass that if we have stabilization, we essentially can get a um, notice of termination. So the approach that we've involved is to do fairly intensive uh, work to restore the land in terms of mulches and so forth. And we essentially have stabilization without having plant growth um, because of what we do. And so we have uh, reduced dust, dust emissions and movement of soil off of it through our technique. And I'll describe a little bit of what that is. Um, the benefits to this are obvious and uh, actually, I have some images showing some of the standard revegetation plants, just so the uh, plant lovers among us here have something to look at. Um, 
This is four wing salt bush, which is one of our workhorses, um, just virtually through the entire state. So the benefits of it, of, of course, as I've alluded to before, is uh, less erosion, less silt clogging our culverts and our concrete box culverts and downstream waterways, uh, fewer dust events. I mentioned that before. We have, um, particularly in the southwest corner of the state, um, severe dust issues. Um, and some of it is, uh, most of it has to do with things originating not within our right of way, but off of adjacent lands. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, better roadside appearance, uh, reduced maintenance. We are one of five states that worked with federal highways and have done carbon sequestration um, studies and um, done some pretty exhaustive kind of research into what cultural practices make the most difference to sequester the most carbon. At that time, uh, the state was looking to make money off the carbon markets, which have since collapsed, but we do expect those to return. And we can prove that through some of our practices, we are sequestering more carbon. Um, so there's, there's that whole piece, and we're very cognizant of that and hope to capitalize on that going forward. And the migration corridor piece I alluded to already, and that's, that's in our minds. As we all know, plants are, are on the march. Um, and uh, we have a very rich um, roadside environment in, in the state. It's actually quite beautiful, as I'm sure most of you are aware. So the steps that we go to when we have disturbed land is that we analyze the slopes to determine what type of seeding we're going to do. Um, I'm going to show you an interactive map uh, that we use, that we developed, um, that gives us our seed list for that. It's based on um, NRCS um, e e ecological zones, but then we customized it using Cynet and we matched it with vendor availability. We'll talk a little bit more about the seed uh, availability issue later. We also have uh, a whole slew of other issues affecting our right-of-way. Much of it has to do with whether there are super steep slopes or um, one of our big problems is uh, water coming onto our right-of-way from adjacent lands which again may be in a degraded condition. So we basically come up with a plan for that and then we do the revegetation. Um, hopefully this link will work. I was going to show you. Um, yes, um, there's an introduction, but essentially this is the state and we have these zones based again on NRCS areas. And one can enter an address or if one goes into any particular area we have seed lists for those particular areas of the state. Um, they, they could be customized and we do customize them further uh, if we feel that we need to. In a perfect world, we'd probably have a custom seed mix for every location. But essentially we go in and we do have some sterile quick cover grasses just to try and get the soil covered a little bit, but they are not recurring. And then the rest of it is follows it's more of a typical regime with cool season grasses that are indigenous warm season grasses, and then um, forbs of various types. And we do uh, are working towards, and this would be a great interest, uh, working towards wild source seed. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but we prefer uh, wild source genotypes if they are available as opposed to named varieties. So that's, uh, basically how it works, and that's on the NMDOT, NMDOT public web, website if anybody um, is interested in that, uh, pursuing that further. Um, Bill, we can't actually see the map, but maybe could we put a link to it in the chat and then folks oh. can look it up on their own? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. I apologize for that. No worries. Um, let's see if I can pull. I was wondering if that would show. Uh oh. Can you uh, see my slide again? I seem to have lost it here. Yes, we can still see the, the slide. Okay. Because uh, I can't see it. All right. Oh, there you we know, go. Sometimes it's hard to find it again. I think I'm there. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, I'll put that um, in the chat. Let's see if I can do that right uh, Whoa.
Sorry, folks. Uh, at the end, I'll put that in the chat so we can um, not interrupt the flow here. So this is a typical DOT project. Uh, this is an aerial view taken from Google Earth, but uh, you see an interchange and there are all these weird things around it. Um, we have two classes of seeding that we use. One is uh, for uh, less steep slopes, we shall say, and uh, we use drill seeding for that, which we find to be very, very successful. We typically do put um, organic amendments, namely compost mulch that comes from green waste in the state. And we till an inch of that into the underlying soil. We also inoculate the soil with mycorrhizae because these are often very damaged, construction damaged soils. We don't archive the set a soil horizon because the mycorrhizae uh, typically don't live more than a couple of months anyway, and they'd be lost. So we re-inoculate those soils we put organic matter into it, we drill seed it, and then we uh, crimp straw into it, and we put a tack of fire over the top of the whole thing. And that's for that's the workhorse of our entire approach. Um, again, we get essentially final stabilization with that, and then we just wait for rain, which, as you know, is in short supply in the Southwest. And so we typically don't expect to get uh, good cover we often get good cover the first year, um, but not the final cover can take two or three years to come in at best where it starts looking like adjacent um, undisturbed area. There are some areas on almost all projects that are very steep and we have uh, come around to a solution of using hydro seeding on those. Uh, we scarify those slopes, we hydro seed them, um, with double the rate of seed application. And then we put rock mulch on the top of those. Um, that retards soil movement and is quite effective actually at preventing erosion in those kind of situations. So that's, that's been our approach in that regard. Here's the typical uh, kind of the workhorse solution, the class A seeding where we're starting to get um, the quick cover grasses coming in. Uh, just to show you what the final result looks like when it's all done. And I uh, removed a bunch of these because I want to cover a lot of other territory, but this is typically what you see out there uh, when it's all done. I was going to jump to a special project that we have going that I've alluded to, and that is, uh, this is in the far southwest corner of the state. The Arizona um, border is a, a vertical line running on the left-hand side of that image. Um, and these show accidents um, in this area that uh, we have uh, some dry, ancient dried lake beds, which actually do fill up with water in the winter monsoons at times. These stretch down into Mexico. This one is called the Lordsburg Playa. It is uh, about 10 miles wide and 30 miles tall, and it um, can at times develop intense um, dust conditions. Some of them are synoptic, meaning they're regional, which we can't do much about. But by and large, we have um, using some uh, several research projects determined that a lot of that dust is related to uh, grazing activities. Uh, cattle break the crust on. So uh, we have had um, close to 50 fatalities in the last 40 years on this stretch of I-10. Um, some of them horrific accidents. There was a particularly bad one um, in, 19, in 2014, where seven people died in 10 minutes. And at 10 minutes later, there was a completely blue sky. It was a dust trail that originated from this. And so we started a project to see if through revegetation, we could address or arrest that situation. This is what these uh, dust storms look like when they come up. They seem very innocuous. People are traveling along 80 miles an hour, and suddenly they can't see 20 feet in front of them. So. Um, it can be horrific what goes on in those situations. So um, if you can superimpose this image in front of you over that uh, aerial that I showed you before, the land ownership, the uh, yellow is BLM land, the green is state trust land. And we determined that a lot of the dust was coming off of uplands on the Western shore due to grazing and then settling out on the playa surface where it becomes entrained in the air if dust and water conditions, uh, rain seems to puff up these kind of soils and then the dust comes along and away we go. And so we have um, embarked on a series of stabilization measures on the Western shore where we are uh, 
uh, doing, we've done, installed hundreds of check dams to arrest silt development, and we are revegetating these areas using some, for us, novel techniques, some of which we can't really do in the roadside environment, but we can do back here. And we've been working on this for eight years cooperatively with state trust land and the grazers, and we're getting ready to uh, work with the BLM on it. We are um, working through an environmental process where uh, we want the BLM to de declare this entire Lordsburg Playa an area of critical environmental concern, which we bring in a special management practices. We are trying to make this a win-win scenario with grazers and, and working with a group out of Arizona that is introducing the savory te uh, technique to grazing, which has to do with um, short duration, high intensity grazing techniques. So these, this is what we're doing out there. Um, we essentially do key lining, which is um, chisel plowing, um, at least 15, 18 inches in the ground. And then we come over and we overseed it. Well, we use a imprinter and then we uh, put a uh, seed over the top of that. And we're working, uh, we've done probably 600 acres in the last six months out there. This is what it looks like when it's done. Um, and there's a shot six, six months later. Um, we get, now this is the interesting thing. And I would say this is true on some level with even our standard revegetation is that we tend to get a very good showing of relic seed that's in the soil already, a less good showing of the things that we planted. They seem to be much slower uh, on the take with it, but the relic seed, and on one level, as long as we get cover, we've met our goal. However, we want quality, stable climax vegetation. So we're still working with that. What we've noticed is that, um, the planted things seem to take a lot longer to come in. Some of it probably is due to them not being completely local seed sources, um, which is what we're trying to address with um, in developing local indigenous seed varieties. So um, jump ahead to the next one. That leads us to this piece. We, uh, the department has a contract with the uh, Institute of Applied Ecology, uh, which Melanie Giesler is so capable leads here in New Mexico. And we are attempting to develop some local seed varieties uh, for use in the, in the trade. Uh, what we'd like to do is set up, just keep going with this. But this particular project is in its fourth year and then the BLM is funding it for another year. Because unfortunately we have a four year limit on these pro um, research projects. But we've identified uh, five plots um, adjacent to I-10 in this instance, some of them right in the right of way and some of them are way back in the back of beyond. And um, the Institute for Applied Ecology has collected local seeds of a whole range of things, which I'll show you. And we've uh, been working with test plots to get the, see how they grow and select for the superior varieties. And the plan is that these will be released to commercial growers and they would be available to anyone who wants to buy them, we'd release them to the industry. Um, it, it's a long, tedious process, as you might know, and it's been quite hampered by the lack of moisture in this part of the state for the last several years. And uh, Mel and your team have been performing admirably under this and teasing out uh, really interesting information from the results of this. Here's a typical test plot, and, and you can see the aridity of this situation out there and what we're working with. So some of the uh, seeds that we thought we'd be working with have not maybe proven to be as successful. Um, here's some details on this and I'm not gonna go into the full thing, but uh, we get these amazingly um, uh, thought out reports from them as we go along, quarterly reports. And um, it's really been fascinating and we, want to be able to continue and expand this elsewhere so that we would essentially be using New Mexico indigenous seeds for most of what we do. For those of you who are familiar with this, uh, most of us go to the same regional sources. So we may be buying seed that's grown in Montana or Oregon or whatnot. And the idea is that uh, following the BLM's national seed strategy, we do want to slowly uh, and ask to become available uh, use more indigenous local seed. 
So this has been a very promising development, but very painstaking and um, we're subject to the vagaries of the climate for sure. The benefits as you all know, are that we that supports native pollinators, which we are very eager to increase in our roadside environment. It provides high quality wildlife habitat, uh, biological diversity, resilience to disturbance, and uh, it sustains ecosystem functions as clean air and water nutrient water and nutrient recycling. So, uh, so that we have some time for questions. This is again a view of our revegetation thing. Um, out there on the Lordsburg Playa. And um, questions? Thank you, Bill. Uh, great presentation. So uh, just a reminder, I'm going to pull questions from the Q&A button on the bottom of Zoom. So if you have questions, put them there. And if you want a question answered, like it, and then it'll, it will be moved to the top. So we can prioritize those. So uh, your first question is, how deep are the impressions made by the imprinter? And do you see before or after imprinting the land? The uh, depth of the imprints are eight inches. And the uh, rough dimensions and plan view are about 16 inches by 16 inches square. We are wanting to develop a more shallow version for use in our roadside environment because we have some constraints there. We can't make pivots that deep because of when vehicles run off the road, that creates drag. It's a whole thing with traffic engineering. But so that's, that's uh, we, we intend to uh, introduce this as part of our standard revegetation. And um, the other question, um, so the part B of that question, can you remind me? Uh, do you seed before or after imprinting the land? Um, we seed after imprinting, and they, they tend to migrate down into the bottom of it, and also any windblown, you know, aeolian deposits um, tend to fall down in the bottom as well, so it gets to be a little bit of seed cover uh, or so cover over the seed itself. We've had very, very promising results from this, you can see in this picture. Uh, next question, um, does the initial cover grass inhibit the succession to native grasses and forbs? And is there a roadside vegetation design which does not require maintenance or mowing? And I can repeat the second half if you need it. The, we have learned by trial and error not to put very much of the quick cover grass in there because the water is really the critical path or the limiting factor, if you will, in that. And if, if the quick cover grasses take it all, there just isn't enough left. So we learned to dial that way back um, and put a very minimal amount in. It's really to get the soil used to growing things again because we're creating a little bit of a uh, a new soil mix, if you will, over the top. And so that's that's pretty much the approach with that. And what, uh, could you repeat the second part of that, please? Yep. Uh, is there a roadside vegetation design which does not require maintenance or mowing? Well, uh, mowing, uh, we are working to reduce that statewide because um, we feel that um, perhaps there's been excessive amount. And again, Keep in mind, if we have 20 or 50 feet off the edge of the pavement, we're only 95% of the state, we're only mowing one pass, which is maybe 16 feet of that. However, um, we are working with our maintenance crews to reduce that to um, after seed set, if possible. And typically, the only reason for mowing, um, there are a couple of reasons for it. One is to um, create um, safety for sight lines because some vegetation can grow tall and people can't um, see what's going on when they're making turns. Or um, it can become a browse habitat for wildlife, which uh, would then jump out into the highway and cause vehicle animal collisions. So we wanna try and reduce that um, factor as well. But um, we found that um, it has to be, if we get a, a good rain year, sometimes they are, have to go out and mow more than once, but 
we're trying to reduce that as much as possible. Great. Uh, next question is, what time of year do you seed and do you ever see the cover crop species stunting the germination of native seed? We seed anytime the ground's not frozen. And unfortunately, this just has to do with the construction schedule. This is typically part of the construction package. And um, as long as the ground's not frozen, we'll move in and, and do that. It's not ideal, but um, that's just, they need to close out these projects and move on. So, uh, and again, the we don't believe the quick cover inhibits um, the growth of it. Um, it's as we use a very minimal amount. Um, you can see if you go into those seed lists, it's quite, quite minor. Um, they don't tend to, they don't recur. So we don't find it to be a huge problem. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this is interesting. Can you speak more about how you are addressing biocrust bio preservation in your dust mitigation work? Yeah, no, that's a fun one. We. We have done the literature review and have looked at the possibility of creating biocrust. What we learned, at least as the ply itself, is that it quite readily forms its own crust. Um, the soil chemistry of there is pretty complex. There are some very intense saline sodic soils, which probably don't support um, biotic crust themselves. However, there are other areas on there which would, and we. We know that there are some plots where that could be created, but what we're trying to do right now is just uh, restrict grazing activities and so that the crust, the natural crust formation forms through when rain occurs out there. And, uh, to, to more fully or completely answer that question, we'd like to pursue the bio crust activity, but we're not sure that this is the location for it. Um, right. Um, next question. Uh, I have inspected, inspected native seeding for my state's DOT, often a qualified contractor is not the low bid and the DOT doesn't have control over the quality of the process. How do you get around this dilemma? Well, we, uh, it's a good question because that's been taking a huge amount of energy over the last few years. When we started, when I started with this program, um, they were doing, uh, I think, fairly low level inferior approach and getting very poor results. And so we changed the entire spec um, and we trained up um, over 200 inspectors statewide. Uh, we have a full-time person in our office who's a restoration ecologist who goes to every single project start off meeting and we inspect the equipment. We have people watching it to make sure it's done properly. Um, so I think we have actually quite good control now compared to before as to how the work is done out there. And because we've uh, using, for those of you familiar with it, but there are erosion um, calculations one can do. And we use one called the revised universal soil loss equation and that you can basically calculate how much erosion you're going to get. And so we've I essentially gone overboard in terms of doing soil amendments and stabilants and all the rest of it so that we know that it's just going to sit there and basically wait for rain and, and germination to occur. So I, I think we've licked the problem of control of the installation, but it's, it's been a huge uphill battle um, and taken lots of training and lots of um, cooperative work with the contracting industry as well. We made, we made the pie larger. In other words, we're spending probably close to uh, seven or eight times per acre what we used to spend to do this work. Um, and I think it's axiomatic, you get, you get what you pay for. So we're happy with that piece of it. Great, um, we're all out of time for questions live um, at this point, but thanks again, Bill. And if you have time, to go back into the question and answer and answer some of the questions that we kind of answer live, uh, that would be great. And Absolutely. I'll, hand it, I'll hand it back over to Maria. Thanks Bill for that great talk. You're welcome. And yeah, we're having some um, questions coming in about the Q and A and 
we're trying to um, moderate those, but just so everyone knows, you should be able to in your Q&A box in the top right corner, there should be a place for you to toggle in between um, filtering by most liked and then filtering by most recent. And so if we're not able to clear out all of the questions before the next talk, if you filter by most recent, you should be able to look at the questions that are for the current speaker. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is Olivia Carroll. Olivia, you can turn on your video and get your slide set up while I introduce you. There you are.